Dr. Seiberg, would you please call the roll? Sure. Good morning, uh, members of the commission. Uh, let's go down the roll real quick. Uh, if you're there, just uh, just holler. Um, Dr. Bullock. Uh, Mr. Childers. Here. Thank you. Dr. Dempsey. Dr. Fleming. Ms. Janeski. Uh, uh, Freebird is here. I see you. Uh, Dr. Grant. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hyatt. Houston, you're here. Um, Mr. Legas. He's muted. Okay, oh, okay thank you. Uh, Mrs. Jones. Here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Locklear. Here. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Loftus. Okay. Dr. Moore. Here. here. Dr. McIntyre? Here. Thank you. Dr. Miller is here. here. Uh, Dr. Weddington? Here. Thank you. And Dr. Wood? We have one. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome commission members, advisors, staff, on-site visitors, and online listeners to the September 24th, 2018 meeting of the North Carolina Professional Educator Preparation and Standards Commission. This Standards Commission develops and recommends to the State Board of Education rules related to all aspects of educator preparation programs. Uh, my name is Patrick Miller. I'm the chairman of the Professional Educator Prep and Standards Commission, and I call this meeting to order. Our agenda and materials are available online through the DPI website, www.ncpublicschools.org, on the State Board of Education meetings link. The meeting is also audio streamed through a link located at the bottom of the eBoard agenda. <coughs> This is a reminder that today's meeting is two hours due to member availability and will end at 11 o'clock instead of noon. I will now read the ethics statement that is required of us. Commission members are reminded that it is our duty to avoid conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts of interest as we handle the work of this commission. Does any member of the commission know of any conflict of interest or any appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before us at this meeting? If so, please state them for the record. If during the course of the meeting you become aware of an actual or apparent conflict of interest, please bring the matter to the attention of the chair. It will then be your duty to abstain from participating in discussion on the matter and from voting on the, the matter. Commission members, you have had an opportunity to review the proposed agenda for today's meeting. Do I have a motion to approve this agenda for September 24th, 2018 meeting? Okay, second. we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda for today's meeting. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? The agenda has been approved. Thank you. Uh, the minutes from our previous commission meeting on August 9th, 2018 have been prepared and made available to you. Do I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. I have a motion. Do we have a second? I have a motion and a second to approve the, the minutes from our meeting on August 9th, 2018. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. The minutes have been approved. Uh, I would now like to call on Dr. Tom Tomberlin to provide the Board of Education updates and to present two items for action. Dr. Tomlin. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, no. 
sorry. Um, <clears throat> good morning, um, commission members. Um, as um, Dr. Miller indicated, earlier this month I presented to the State Board of Education on the request for permits to teach for teachers um, in North Carolina whose license has ex had expired on June 30th, 2018 as a result of failure to meet their licensure exam requirements. Um, and so just want to go with you over briefly uh, the what we have learned about those um, requests that have been made. So just to remind you very quickly, the target population here were educator prep completers with an initial uh, professional license that expired on June 30th, 2018, who did not have a passing score on, the required, on their required exams. Um, also, lateral entry completers um, with a 2018, uh, June 30th, 2018 expiration who had not completed their, uh, their testing. I want to be clear about this, that we, <clears throat> we did not allow lateral entry completers who failed to finish their coursework to apply for a permit to teach under this. This was restricted only to those passing, not passing their licensure exam. Uh, the State Board of Education has a different process for those who can <coughs> complete their coursework on time. Um, and then also, educator um, prep completers with an IPL that expires June 30th, 2019, who do not have a passing score on the required exams. That's because that would be their second year of teaching and that they would, um, the license would be forfeit if they did not pass the test by, um, by the, the, the deadline. Uh, and then finally, educator prep completers with an initial license that expires on June 30th, 2020. These folks have a requirement to attempt the test and we found that there were a number of those who, who did not make that attempt in their first year of teaching. So the requests for permits were issued to the LEAs and charter schools on August 1st. Um, we've received um, requests from 50 of the 115 LEAs, so a little less than half. Seven charter schools responded to the request. That's not um, Surprising given that charter schools don't have the same requirement for licensed teaching staff as, as public schools do. In total, there were 298 requests for a permit to teach. Given the missingness in the data, um, we would interpret any of these um, statistics I'm about to share with you cautiously. Um, they may not represent what's actually going on across the state. Um, and we will... Uh, be communicating with the field soon about um, getting all these permits to teach in because an analysis of the of the licensure data and the payroll data indicates that the there are many more teachers out in the field teaching with an expired license than we have permits to cover. So there's clearly an issue going on here and we have to have better communication and get those lists out there. Mrs. Jones. So Tom, is it possible for at Pank which I believe you and Dr. Peter Martin will be part of um, in October for you all to in, have, have this conversation at that point um, because I know just from my conversation with several districts, you know, it was very difficult for them to track initially right. and um, some of them were experiencing problems with submitting the data. So if that's something that, and you may already have that on your agenda to cover. Um, Yes, we, we, we do. We're going to work with um, the State Board of Education, um, well, with this group actually, and the State Board of Education about establishing a date. We have to have a date which we're going to cut this off and say you've got to have it in by this date, but we're, um, we will also want to work with all d districts across the state to make sure that if they have teachers that need a permit to teach, we help them get those, those on there. And we're doing work on our side of identifying <clears throat> the teachers from the state perspective. You can imagine for the large districts is a hard lift to do. It's really hard to do it from the state <coughs> side, but we're trying to um, we're trying to get a list of those teachers and maybe push them out to the LEAs and say these are your teachers that are in problem areas. <clears throat> um, really quickly, the reasons that we have for this, you can see that in the yellow, these are our um, did not attempt in the first year. Um, which is about a third, well, a little more than a quarter of the recipients. We feel this is just generally a problem. 
that people aren't even attempting the test. This shows maybe a misunderstanding about what the requirements are. Is this a problem that licensure should have better communication with um, initially licensed teachers? Um, do the LEAs need better information about um, tracking these folks? Do we need to work this into our beginning teacher support process to make sure that questions about uh, attempting and passing a test are part of the mentor-mentee relationship? Uh, and then you can see that the, um, the failure to pass in the second and third year um, make up the bulk of these, of these requests. We also wanted to look at this by student population. So we looked at where these, these requests for permits to teach were coming from in terms of um, student population served. And you can see at the bottom of this graph, we, so schools in the lowest, yeah, there you go. Schools in the lowest minority quartile had very few percentage-wise of these requests to permit to teach. So schools that are serving um, non-minority populations, this is not really a problem, but if you look at the third and the fourth quartile of minority, these are schools that are serving our highest student minority student populations, and they make up about three quarters of the requests for a permit to teach. So this is, a, this is concerning to us that, that, this, um, that the, the, the inability of the teachers to pass the licensure test is concentrated in schools that serve high minority populations. Um, again, I can't speak to why they're not passing the test, so much, but I just know that those who aren't are, are um, consolidated in these schools that serve high mo minority populations. So, Tom, I'm yes. sorry. No, that's I, okay. know, I feel like the need to, to put in a little bit of a qualifier there in saying that um, we have identified that the test is a problem, at least one of those tests are a problem, and that there are several licensure um, testing related uh, issues from reciprocity with out-of-state to uh, teachers in-state who are taking tests that not ne should never really have been required because they're not in legislation. So I feel like when we, we put data up there like that, it looks like we're hiring uh, teachers who are not qualified just because they can't pass the, te pass the test. And I believe you've done a presentation on the, about the fact that there's not a correlation necessarily between student achievement and the pass rates for teachers, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, so, as I said when I started, these data are limited and I don't think we should draw too many conclusions with this, but um, I do think if this, is, this equity issue is something we keep an eye on and we know that these schools, uh, that these schools that serve higher mo populations of minority and EDS students also have lower percentages of their teachers as being effective or highly effective than, than these other schools. So this general trend fits what we see when we look at the data in, from other lenses uh, in terms of teacher effectiveness um, and things like years of experience, attrition. Um, these these you know, negative factors are generally much more prevalent in, um, in schools that serve higher EDS and, and minority student populations. But your point is well taken. Um, and then <clears throat> we looked at this by low performing school status from the 16-17 school year. Uh, this actually is, actually reflects the, the population of low performing versus non-low performing. So we didn't see anything really disturbing or alarming here. Um, <clears throat> and that's maybe a little bit of good news in, in this. And then finally, we looked at um, requests by LEA urbanicity. So if you start on the left hand of this, it goes from rural remote, and then it goes all the way up to city, large city. So the more to the right you go, the more urban the setting. And you can see that the, that the problem is, is what we would expect. This, this, the, the, the permits to teach are affecting more rural and more urban districts, and they are generally the ones that struggle with human capital issues more than, than other districts. The ones in the middle, the towns and the suburban districts, generally seem to be shielded against these, these issues. And so we need to think about this. What other, what other uh, urban area besides Charlotte are we talking about with this 90? So that 90 would include Charlotte, Wake, Fayetteville, Greensboro. Um, there's a... <clears throat> 
We have a um, we have an education directory called Eddie, and they classify the districts uh, according to these delineations, and I just picked those up to classify the requests as they came in. Okay, so 90 is the is the actual number. Yes. So Percentage-wise, that's probably not as disturbing. Percentage-wise, that's about a third, right? Uh, are coming from large city. If you if you include if you include uh, mid-sized city, that's gonna that's gonna put you up a little less than half. Of those, but of those the, that have requested permits to teach now. Of those who have requested permits to teach now, correct. That's right. fine. Which right. is less than half of our right. IAs. And then finally, we looked at growth under this, and so I didn't look at all growth uh, because originally when this started out, the problem was presented as an elementary, a largely an elementary problem because of um, teachers' inability to pass the math test. So I went back and looked and said, of these requests, how many of these teachers have EVOS in reading, math, or K2 literacy? And as you can see, 89 of the 298 have a, uh, an EVOS growth score. Now the growth scores look fine. They don't look particularly um, skewed towards the does not meet expected growth, which goes back to our finding that the math test is probably not telling us a whole lot about the teacher's um, future effectiveness. But what strikes me about this is, is these requests, um, less about less than a third of them are teachers that are teaching in elementary school and receiving an EVOS score. And so I, I'm concerned that if, if the problem is with, with elementary teachers not being able to pass the math test, why we're not seeing more of those teachers showing up in the data as, as requesting a permit to teach. And is that because, uh, is it a reporting issue? Is it because those teachers are doing something else in those schools other than teaching a traditional um, elementary program, I, I, I don't know. It just seems like a low number um, to me, given the number of requests we had. I would have expected more elementary teachers with EVOS scores to be in that, in that request than what we saw. I'm happy to take any questions on any of this if, if anybody um, has any. Hey, Tony, I have a question. Uh, back to the So uh, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, if I presented this as the percentage of the request, it would look it, the, it would have the same visual effect. Um, what I would need to have is the entire population of those of those LEAs across the state and the percentage of their entire population that's requesting a permit to teach. However, I also don't have that for everyone. So the data will be skewed no matter how I present it. And I thought maybe just numbers right now would, would suffice. I don't mean to suggest that, I, I think it is evident that there is less of a problem in rural or what we would call ex-urban settings than there is in rural or urban settings. I think that's the message I'm trying to say. Not that this is, disproportionately affecting um, large urban districts. I don't think that's the case at all. I just think the, the data are at those two ends of the spectrum. This may be kind of a ridiculous question. How does a teacher, who, 
who informs a person that has an expired license that it's expired and here, here's one, two, three, four, you've got to do before you're through. Where does that come from? So that is going to need to come from the state, the licensing, uh, the, the Office of Licensure here in, in DPI. So we are currently, we currently have these, these identified folks, but as you can imagine, we're going through every single request to make sure that that person really does need to either have their license expired or they need to be taken off their current license and put on a permit to teach. Um, because this represents a loss to these, to these individuals and, and, and they deserve you know, as much due diligence as we can, as we can give them. But, but I, they do get a, an official kind of will, letter? That they will get a letter telling them what, what's happened and how they remedy that. Um, and that by the end of June 30th of 2019, that permit to teach expires and there's no other path. Do you send it as a registered letter or? Um, we would have to work with legal on this, but my preference on this, and, I, and, and our director of licensure is not, is not with us today, but my preference would be that we'd have both a letter going to the individual and to the LEA that's employing the individual. So our LEAs do a good job of letting us know when our CEUs are up or when our licensure needs to be renewed. So, I, I, I mean, I can't speak for every LEA, but. Um. Well, to, to Freebird's point, we do in the normal situation, right? But to, I think to your point, um, we have this X number out there that really you've not heard from the LEAs about. And so we have teachers out there without a permit to teach. No one's applied for that on their behalf. And it could be, um, I guess you all are matching that with payroll, and you know they're working somewhere, right. right? So then the LEAs need to get that information. If they've had a change in licensure specialist at the LEA or a change in their HR administrator, sometimes those things fall through. Um, they just fall through the hole. And so hopefully, we're, to his point, we're gonna, LEA is gonna get something and the teacher will get something, right? Well, at some point, there's gonna be a property right issue that that uh, you no longer can I earn a living, and nobody told me. <laughs> right. um, but I would say that the majority of the LEAs out there are, well, as to his point, we're right on that, right? We know that the larger you get, the harder that type of thing is to track, right? So that becomes a monumental issue when folks come in and they're on tiered licensure pathways and then some one individual or two in a county the size of Wake or the county the size of Charlotte, you know, and I'll even go as far to say like Guilford, and they're trying to track these folks from the onset. Uh, you got a temp the first year, you got a pass by the end of the second year, but oh by the way, while we're doing that, we're tracking lateral entry too. So to your point, somebody has to own that and it sounds like the state is working very hard right now to help us close that gap, right? Uh, yes, that is um, that is the case, and I think the the point you made about um, it's it's hard to track in this in the first year, second year, is is absolutely true because what we're seeing, I think, in the in the permits to teach, is mostly um, the third years are pretty the people that are get, that are in their third year. They send off a red flag in the LEAs, and I think the LEAs are aware of it. Now, some of these teachers. Their license will expire, and, and the LEA chose not to, re, to request a permit to teach. The policy states it's, it's not automatic. The LEA has to say, that is an effective teacher I want to teach. So we have to imagine that there's a fair number of these that are just being allowed to expire, and the LEA is not taking any action to, to renew the license. And that's, oh, not to renew the license, but request the permit to teach. The problem seems to be, the, the biggest problem that I'm seeing in the data is the second year. Um, we've got, from, from what I can see, we've got about 1,700 teachers that are employed right now that we have no record of a test. And so we're going to have to, that's going to take a lot of work to go through all those. Now, not all those should have an expired license, but that's the, that's the list we're going to have to start going through individual by individual. And, um, and they deserve that attention, every single one of them do. So we will we will make sure we give them that due consideration and, and, and act appropriately. 
Hey Marie, this is Connie again. I have another question. Um, going back to the slide, the Swiss by student population looking at the um, highest the four trials with the minority, the highest and lowest four trials. Um, you stated earlier that you were a little concerned about this and you really weren't um, again that that you really didn't understand the cause. I think that's what you said in reference to that. Um, do you think that this may have something, this is just my thought, um, as someone said earlier, targeting teachers and you're looking at these, if you look at these high minority quartiles and high uh, minority communities, these are probably going to be your high poverty communities also. Yes, there is certainly overlap. Do you think there's a correlation there and that's probably, I mean, when you're looking at recruiting teachers to these communities, compared to with other communities where they have a higher supplement that they can offer teachers. When you're looking at these high poverty communities, these are going to be your high minority uh, communities. It may be looking at that, there could be something that could be put in place to recruit teachers to these high minority communities. I think that is certainly on the state's agenda. Um, <clears throat> With, I mean, I think of what's going on with Leandro and the focus of ESSA to um, ensure equitable access to effective teaching to all students across the state. I, um, I cannot speak directly to any policy levers we might pull at this time in regard to that, but uh, yes, I think you're hitting on something that's, um, that's concerning on just about any uh, outcome measure we can look at when we disaggregate it by poverty and race, um, it seems that the poor minority students are on the short end of the stick, as it were. Thank you, Andrew. You're welcome. Good job. All right. All right. What is the day? Oh, we need to we need to come up with some recommendation. It's on here. I'm sorry. I do have a recommendation for you. <laughs> um, in LIC in zero zero one, on page eighteen, under section one point nine zero permit to teach, uh, we are recommending uh, that the state board of education adopt a policy that the LEA or charter school may request a permit to teach until January 25th, 2019, to be issued for the 18-19 academic school year. This would give folks who have not yet, um, or who are unable to gather this list of uh, teachers that need to be on a permit to teach, time to apply for such a, a permit um, and still, uh, and, and have their teacher's license for the, for the school year. Um, we, that also gives us in the state a little time to go through all these um, these records and make sure we're identifying and able to push out that list to all LEAs. So that is the um, the date that we're. So I have a question. Yeah. Okay, just and, and I, Kim and I talked about this a little bit, but I want to clarify this for the minutes. So this per, this permit to teach that we're referencing here is the one that's tied specifically to the testing issue requirements, right? Because part of the alternative licensure route, not to be confused with that route, is the permit to teach, then the emergency permit, that's and right. going to residency, right? And I mean, I'm reading that, I just want to make sure that we're clear that that's, this ends January 2019, and it's solely for the purpose of the, um, uh, what we just granted, right, for the, to those that did not pass the test or attempt it. The other permit to teach stays still on the books. That's correct, absolutely. So um, I just wanna make sure that um, if it is not abundantly clear from the way it's constructed, we should make it abundantly clear. Do right. need to, um, I'm thinking um, we could say something like for the teachers identified in this paragraph, or something to that yes, effect. Yes, I, I think so, because that's really tied to that second paragraph under 1.90, not back, to, it's not referencing back the first. And I understand that, but I just don't think it's right. abundantly clear. I'm, I'm with you. I don't, don't want any confusion. Um, so, 
we can get some, um, how we want, I'll defer to Dr. Cyberg on how we, we handle making that little change. I mean, you could say this provision we can make a expires. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That language in right now. Okay. Something to along the lines of this provision expires, blah, 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 you know, whatever. The July 1, 2018 provision expires as of January 25th, 2019, or something like that, Tom. Yeah, I'm sure you more submit that better, but. The exception granted on whatever day whatever. <clears throat> expires on January the 25th, 2019. All right. <coughs> can you, Kim, can you open up just a, a blank word document and have it shared? Okay. And that way we can type it real quick. And, and then we approve it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll know what we're, we're putting in there. So the, the July 1st, 2018 provision will expire. Can we just say it like that? Will expire on January 25th, 2019? Is that clear enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Legal folks. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Are you making that a motion? I'm making that a motion that we um, amend uh, LICN 001 as uh, presented by Dr. Tom over there. Amend and approve? Yes. All right. So we have a motion uh, to amend. Uh, LICN-001 as presented and to approve that policy as presented. Oh, I, there's one other thing on here. I apologize. Sure. Go ahead. The psychologist. I think, are we doing that's, this? Uh, that's kind of later in the yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 That's not in this. I just didn't want to prove that we have that. Sure. I I Do we have a second? Second. Who, who was the first? I didn't hear the first. It's Glenn. You're Glenn. Glenn. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve uh, the changes to LICN-001 uh, as presented and to approve the policy and recommend it to the State Board for their consideration. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? And that policy change has been approved. Thank you. Okay, the Pepsi annual report. Uh, Dr. Evans will present the annual report uh, for September 1, 2017 to September 1, 2018 uh, to be approved by the commission. Dr. Evans. Good morning, everyone. Um, Senate Bill 599 requires an annual report from Pepsi, and it is due to uh, the Joint Legislative Education Oversight Committee by December 1st. 2018 and then every year hereafter as well as to the State Board of Education to be approved before it goes to the Joint Legislative Committee. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of what the report contains. Um, it starts off with an introduction as to what Pepsi is and then it talks about the membership and the structure of the membership and how they were appointed and then a listing of the names and the positions of their roles within the education field. Then we go to the roles of um, who at DPI, here at DPI, have, have uh, are involved with Pepsi. And then the structure of the meetings as well as um, a summary of their of their focus with a policy reference chart as to what was focused on during those meetings. And also for each meeting, 
we have a link as to where the minutes are so that that's easy access for anyone looking at the, the annual report. Then we go into areas of focus moving forward with the subcommittees and what is going to be focused on from here on out, from September on. And this is the structure of the, um, the annual report that will also follow for future reports. Are there any questions? I had spoken via email with Dr. McIntyre, and she had a question um, about the adequacy issue. Dr. Seiberg or Dr. Evans, would one of you please uh, address that to Dr. McIntyre? Sure, this is, this is Andrew. I just wanted to jump in because um, uh, Dr. Evans wasn't privy to the, the, uh, the activity uh, in the fall. But basically, the issue of uh, the, de the definition of adequacy was a, a, a hot topic. Hot topic in the in the beginning of the the, the first couple of meetings with Pepsi, um, and what actually would we we convene a, a a subcommittee to to think about that topic, and in that discussion, um, what what bore out of that discussion was it's uh, th that there would be less concern about the, the, the definition of adequacy if there was more comfort with the tests associated with uh, licensure, specifically the Pearson math test. And so that's how uh, we got uh, started down the path of looking at uh, the Pearson math tests, uh, convening a math stakeholder group uh, to look at uh, possible additional tests. Um, and then later on, as of the summer, then the issue of the Pearson math test it showed up in, for a different context, but uh, the original rationale was to address the issue of adequacy. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of background as to how we, how we have gone about uh, trying to address the, the topic of adequacy uh, that was brought up. Right in, in so that, that actually means that we wait until the subcommittee on the testing has um, finishes that work and makes a recommendation to the state board and then and then we can go back and, and define that word adequacy in this bill is that is that how you're thinking about this um, Dr. McIntyre, my, my understanding was that, that um, if we could address the issue of the math test, that, that adequacy may not need to be addressed in terms of the policy itself. But um, I think at the conclusion of the, the, uh, the math um, investigation um, and subsequent recommendations to the subcommittee, um, if, if that issue of adequacy is not yet addressed and you still feel the, the need to address it, um, it certainly can be brought up by this group. Yeah, I think that it certainly there would need to be a language change. I mean, we may not, we may feel like it's addressed, but the language actually says adequacy of coursework and it's not just about math so so we might want to just change some language in it but, but, let, but, but that means we wait until this testing issue is resolved which is fine okay and we'll make we'll, we'll make sure that we have that in notes to to pick that up at, at the conclusion of the math um, which we're we're chugging along on so we should have some resolution on that soon are there other questions for dr evans Uh, hearing none, I will entertain a motion to approve the Pepsi annual report. Motion. Have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Can you say who that was on the telephone, please? Lauren Genesky. Thank you, Ms. Janeski. So we have a motion and a second to approve the Pepsi annual report. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approval, please say aye. aye. Are there any opposed? The report has been approved. Thank you. All right, next, Dr. Tomberlin and Dr. Seiberg will present some policy items for action. Hello again. Um, I am bringing eval, policy eval 002 to the commission for a recommendation to move to the State Board of Education. Uh, this is 
Um, the infield, out of field policy. Um, this previously resided in LIC in 001. Um, it didn't. Sorry, go ahead. Do you have a question? No, no, I, I, never mind, sorry. Oh, that's okay. No? Um, <clears throat> so this previously exist, uh, lived in LIC in 001, and we felt like it wasn't really licensure policy. It was, um, it was a federal reporting requirement, and so we've moved it out to eval 002. Um, I think I need to clarify, I think this policy came up for some discussion last time, and I need to clarify what this is about. Um, <clears throat> the federal requirement used to, under ESEA was highly qualified, and there were certain criteria that were associated with highly qualified. And a teacher, an individual teacher, was deemed to be highly qualified or not highly qualified. Uh, ESSA does something different. It looks at the ass every assignment between a teacher and a course and says, does the teacher have the appropriate licensure for that course? So if you've got a teacher who's teaching three sections of math, certified in math, but teaches one section in science, the, teacher, the teacher's three math sections would be in, a, in field, and the teacher's science section would be out of field. The teacher, him or herself, is not in or out of field, but those individual assignments. And so for a school, you look at all the courses that you teach, and you determine whether every one of those courses is taught by an infield or out of field teacher, and you divide the number of infields you've got by the total number of <coughs> courses taught, and that gives you your infield percentage. Um, the federal government wants these reports um, as part of their our accountability um, system. Our understanding from the federal government is this in no way affects Title I or Title II funding. It does. There's no um, sanctions if if it falls below, above, or below a certain level. Um, primarily, what we're interested in is ensuring that whatever the rate of out of field assignment is, that that is not disproportionately visited upon students of color, poverty, or uh, exceptional children status. So this would be part of the equity analysis for the state. We would look at if these. For a school with a given rate of, let's say, 5% out of field, do you see that rate uh, that students in those classes that are out of field are disproportionately minority, poverty, or some other kind of subgroup that we're measuring? And so that's the purpose of this. Um, and so we indicate here which licenses would be considered in field or out of field. And according to um, the policy, um, that we lifted out of LIC in 001. Um, teachers with a um, permit to teach, teacher, long-term substitutes, teachers on a permit to teach or an emergency license or on a provisional license are considered out of field. Teachers with an initial license, a lateral entry license, or a continuing license are considered in field if their license matches, is appropriate for the, the subject that they're teaching. And it could be any license that they have. If they have multiple licenses, we do the test against every license the teacher has to determine in or out of field assignment. So that is the, uh, the policy, and I think we have some, probably have some discussion about this policy. So I, I have a question about that because the example Tom gave there with the math science, I have, that we're considering a teacher that may be a 25-year veteran teacher that teaches math and they come to us and maybe they taught science um, in a non-public charter school or a public charter school where they weren't required to have a license in that area or they taught in a um, some other type of private school setting and now all of a sudden we we go through the hoops we get them licensed by the state with a provisional area added for science knowing they have time to complete the qualifiers right that person is considered out of field yet a lateral entry teacher or a residency teacher and I understand that lateral entry teacher could take the test in science and that's the qualifier but all of a sudden we're saying they're in field just because they have a four-year degree they've taken the test they have no pedagogy other than passing the test we've already established that there's very little correlation between student effectiveness and um, passing a test so 
I struggle with the fact, even if there's not, there's just a reporting requirement. ESSA now allows us, since No Child Left Behind went away, ESSA allows us to say, as long as the state provides a license for that area, that person can be considered highly qualified. So why are we still separating out or sifting through and saying we're going to consider the... Now, I understand if I've got that principal who has not gone through HR and has a teacher teaching out of field, and we've not applied for a license. That's the old definition of being out of field. You know, they're teaching math, and for some reason I find out when I walk through an open house that XYZ <coughs> teacher also is teaching a section of science, and they're not licensed. Well, immediately I'm asking that principal, you know, that teacher needs to contact HR, we need to get a professional license, or else they're going to be considered out of field. Well, they're out of field either way. So why would we go through making a teacher pay to get a license for that area if we're still going to consider them out of field? And y'all may have other thoughts on that, but... Well, I, I do want to, to articulate the, the position of of the State Board of Education in terms of this policy. So the, the point you raised is, is true. You could have a science teacher who's, who's done a lot of um, outside work or work we don't know about in teaching mathematics and, and would be a great teacher to teach those, those students. The problem is, is in policy, I can't distinguish that teacher from a PE teacher who's provisionally licensed to teach advanced math and may not have any math credit. So I have no way, both those teachers are considered in field. So how does the policy recognize that this teacher may be an appropriate, may have all the experience he or she needs to teach that class um, and therefore should be identified as in field, but this other teacher who has no business teaching that class should be out of field. And I don't know if the policy can, can do both because the reality is both examples exist in the field. There are teachers on both sides of that issue and we have no way to distinguish between them. The, the reason that, that we pushed it this way is we decided to focus on the content. The content is the driver, not the preparation. What we're saying is this teacher has had adequate content um, to teach that particular subject. And that may not be the right way to do it, but that's, I'm just telling you how this, this determination came about. Because when we're talking about a permit to teach or an emergency licensed teacher, we're saying that we know the content is not sufficient to qualify for another path. And th that's why we drew the policy that way. But this is certainly up to discussion by, by the commission um, to take to the board. What what are the ramifications for the district? It sounded like I think, and you mentioned that it's just a reporting requirement. Would that particular would that teacher come up as a salary exception or anything that would be an issue for the district? No. Mm -hmm. no. It just is not like that. In the, uh, for the district there, uh, depending on how it's reported, particularly looking at the equity concerns, um, it could be some bad public relations if you have high We have to report it. To around. your point, uh, the bottom of that policy, we have to send out a notification to parents of uh, professional qualifications if it's a Title I school. Yet I can have a lateral, no offense to lateral entry, <laughs> because we've had teachers of the year and great folks. I can put a teacher, I can put a lateral entry teacher in there with either a test or some coursework, and, and that person is considered in field, and I don't have to notify parents. But I put a veteran teacher, whether it's an art teacher, a PE teacher, somebody that spent X number of years in an educational setting, giving, getting professional development in lots of different areas, and has been through a, an approved program, and I give them a provisional license, I've got to report them as being out of field for that purpose. And, you know, I understand that it's just a reporting requirement. It just does not, it's, it's hard to, it's not palatable to, to be able to say that I've convinced a teacher that's a veteran 
to take a class because this is their area of passion or this is an area that you know they worked in some at some point in the past and we get them provisionally licensed and we meet the state requirements for licensure yet we don't need it for being in field I hear you but I don't guess we have an alternative do we? well I was and I don't mean this sarcastically but do you have a, a recommendation for us to consider that would be be different i do I, i'm not sure why we don't add the provisional licensures to the category the same the same category as the lateral and the residency why would provision will not be included with that is that an option dr Tomble? Uh, you can recommend anything you'd like to the state board of education um, I, I do have to say this policy reflects the existing State Board of Education approved policy. So all we've done, we haven't changed anything on this policy that wasn't a, that the State Board approved. We just took it out of LIC and then dropped it in this new policy. So you could certainly make any change you want. I cannot speak to how the board would receive that. Um, and I understand that. I understand it's the exact same language, but I see this commission being tasked with fixing some things that maybe have not made sense for a number of years um, you know and in talking with other HR folks in the field the same question comes up you know why would we consider our provisionally licensed veteran teachers out of field when we're not you know and we consider these other folks who have come in by I mean, we need those other folks I want to continue to say that but uh, they're highly qualified and in field and our veteran people who we've added the provisional to are not. I mean, I mean I'm not trying to be difficult. <laughs> it's no, just it doesn't that. make sense. I have a suggestion I that may don't. or may not be accepted, but if there's no time constraint on sending this policy to the state board, is this something that can be discussed at PAC in October and, and get a majority? or at least a consensus among the HR folks in paint and then move forward with that? Uh, sure, so we will have state paint, we can we can raise it at state paint, and then we will also have an intervening um, teacher recruitment and retention task force that we could bring a recommendation to the commission from them as well. Dr. Jones, is that? It is, I will just say that um, someone texted me because they're listening in and, and it had a very good point that the, the sole purpose for this policy at the time was because of no child left behind um, this, this is not correct this was not, changed this was changed after no, so the when ESSA of no came child into left. effect and in ESSA came into effect we we eliminated highly qualified language and out changed of the policy it over to match this ESSA we didn't we didn't make it highly qualified doesn't match this definition this definition was created as a response to ESSA, and then we took that back to the board. Okay. Uh, I can't remember when it was taken, um, but the board approved the, the policy as it, as it looks now after the, after the sunset of ESEA and the advent of ESSA. Sorry, what was your question? I was just asking if anyone was opposed to uh, tabling a vote on this policy so that the personnel administrators of North Carolina Bank uh, can have some input on this in their conference next week. I think that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Everybody on the telephone okay with that? Okay. So we'll, we'll move in uh, next to the uh, change in LICN-001 that affects uh, school psychologists. Uh, so this, again, is, is, a, is a different section of LICN-001. Uh, this is section 1.55, eligibility for provisional licensing. Um, and so the rules related to school psychology um, <coughs> It has come to our attention that the National Certification for School Psychologists uses the same licensure exam that the state uses to license its school psychologists. So this provision just allows for the National School Psychologist credential to be used um, as, a, as a means of, of meeting the standard, the license exam requirement. And so the, the, the candidate for licensure could submit either the, 
their test scores or this certification to licensure for the purposes of, of receiving the license. We do make it clear in this policy that and, and, I, and I want to be very clear that this is not what we would call reciprocity. We're not saying there's something, here's, here's our test and here's your test and they're different, but we're going to call them the same. This is, here's our test, here's your test, and they're exactly the same. And we're recognizing that they're exactly the same. We will only grant this insofar as the national license continues to use a test that is the same as North Carolina's test for licensure. If that changes, then the state board reserves the right to withdraw that, that approval and, and can reevaluate um, that relationship. Also, the request from the, um, from the consultant, the DPI consultant in school psychology, is that they're concerned about the, the length of time it takes to clear a license for school psychologists. And they've asked to stipulate that a school psychologist license shall be issued to the individual within 30 days of submission of a completed ap application. Um, and so that um, would, would put those school psychologist applications to the front of the queue from uh, terms of licensure. So I have a question about that. Sure. So how can we put um, a, a any type of timeline in there for one category of certified staff and put those folks ahead of teachers? I think, that, I think that is a concern. Um, so that's not something that I could even vote for because to put a 30-day window in there for one cat and we need school psychologists, so I'm not saying we don't, sure. but I'm, I'm just not certain why we would put not put 30 days for teachers. Teachers may be sitting for, um, and, and license, I, this is not a reflection on licensure either because they're processing lots of, of um, licensure requests. But they could be sitting for several months. And in some districts, those teachers are paid on the substitute teacher salary schedule until the license is itch issued. And then it's retro to back. But then here we're taking and saying we're going to take a category, make it different than all the other certified licensure categories, and put a 30 day uh, requirement on that for DPI to issue a license. That just doesn't, it doesn't sound reasonable. I, I, oh. I'd like to comment on that. I understand what you're saying, Glenda, uh, fully. Uh, recognize the difficulty and time frame that teachers have getting through the licensure process. But there are different categories. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the social and emotional issues that kids are confronted with now and our ratio of like one to 5,000 or whatever, school psychologists to uh, student population, I think there's an urgency here that can be addressed because I also don't think we're going to be overrun with people, school psychologists, who are going to you know, rush to the door because this new policy exists. Uh, I am totally in favor of the policy. I think it makes absolute sense. It probably ought to be applied as quickly as we can across the board where other teachers, and I know we do that in reciprocity, but where there's exact alike conditions. There should be no question. There might not be a 30-day window on all of those. But uh, I'm going to vote for it and fully respect what you're saying. Uh, I've been living with the same teacher for 52 years. So I'll, to, to that, Dr. Houston, I will say I that we go ahead and hire these folks before they get licensed by the state, just how we do any other teacher. We go ahead and hire them. To put a 30-day um, application or a licensure completion date in there for that mental health category, so then our social workers are, are a huge part of our mental health team in the, in the school district. So our school, our school social workers, our psychologists, our EC teachers, our um, speech pathologists, all those folks are part of that team. And we hire them and then we make application for a license for all of them, including our teachers. But this is pushing that one group ahead of all those others. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I do understand the mental health needs um, in our school districts. It's just, it's an anomaly that we're creating to put in policy and it just doesn't seem to be a very good reason behind that because you can't do it for all the categories of folks. I'm with you, I understand. And, and <clears throat> nobody's being denied employment, right? No. I mean, so if, if teachers are being hired 
before, and I know they're hired right. before their license comes through. I mean, we have folks that graduate in May and they start working, right. and then their license gets processed and everything's fine. So, if everyone who's working in a public school is hired and then licensed when the license comes through, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of I'm not sure why we would. We would and I'm, I'm with Dr. Houston, and I'm going to vote for the policy because it makes sense. It's the right thing to do. I just don't understand the timeline. Putting a timeline constraint on the what? The what is the advantage? of the 30-day timeline from the individual. From whose perspective? <laughs> I, mean, or who, I, mean, I mean, everybody wants to be licensed more right. quickly. Okay. But. So I guess, Tom, it would go back to the fact that the difference here being there are still districts that are hiring teachers and putting them on the substitute rate of pay until their license is issued by the state. And I mean, I, we're not one of those districts you know we go ahead because we know these folks can be licensed and we feel very comfortable doing that but there are districts that do not feel comfortable doing that they're not certain that this person is going to be licensed or that but they hire them to on uh, dr myers point they hire them and they bring them on board it's just where did 30 days come from just out of the blue for one category of staff because they're all needed so um I think the the so this this policy is related to some original legislation that was um, presented in the last session that the, the bill did not make it through, and in that bill was a was a provision that those licenses be cleared in sixty days from sixty days of submission. I think that was in the original policy you had, and I had um, an email from the DPI consultant saying. Could we change it to 30 because 60 days was actually longer than most school psychologists are waiting for their license to clear? So I think the 30 from the 60 is because it's it's representing. It sounds like on average it's taking somewhere between 30 and 60 days to get a school psychologist license cleared, and the 30 the push is to make it make it happen sooner. Um, I will say that within LIC and 001, there are a couple of these uh, push to the top provisions, one of them being teachers from out of state that have effectiveness data. They're supposed to be prioritized. Um, teachers who with military um, spouse or military connections are to be prioritized. Um, this is another piece of prioritization. And so perhaps, um, the policy to accept the national licensure is is certainly right. is great, and nobody's um, discounting that. Um, it may be good work for this commission and those who may work on a um, a, a kind of revision of LIC in 001 to take into account to 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 think about the prioritization of licensure across the state. Are there are there things that we want to prioritize? And that should be in a comprehensive approach to prioritizing, not just kind of picking certain things and saying, well, that needs to go faster and that needs to go faster. If everything is, is identified as needing to go faster, then nothing goes faster. Um, and so I think a comprehensive approach to this might be a better solution to really sit down and say, what do schools need? What are the areas of, of, of real critical need that should be prioritized and put that into policy in a, in a very comprehensive way? Can that be done on Dr. Seidberg, Dr. Evans, and licensure subcommittee? We can certainly apply it to that subcommittee, yeah. However, I think we ought to go ahead and take some action on the the meat of the, yes. of the licensure issue. And I would make a motion that, uh, that the language be accepted as written and moved to the state board as urgently as we can get it there. And we have a motion uh, to approve the changes regarding the school psychologists in the LICN-001 uh, with the caveat to push it to the state board as quickly as possible. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second uh, to approve LICN-001 as presented. 
Is there any further discussion? I really would have liked to have seen an amendment to the policy first to take out the 30 days. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Hearing, is there any further discussion? Comments? Hearing none, all in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, uh, the policy passes. Thank you. And Dr. Seiberg, are you going to do TCED 009? Yes, sir. Um, and this is a quick one. So TCED 009 um, came to, uh, to to this commission in August, uh, and um, there was approval to to um, to revise the title and the first sentence there that this applies to initial professional licenses uh, or residency licenses. Um, and in doing so, what we didn't have in there, which we now have in there, um, is in section two under the, the, uh, the GPA requirements, we had in there uh, degree seeking. And so we're striking degree seeking because this is allowing for uh, students um, that are not degree seeking to, to be a part of this. Uh, process since we've included residency license in there. So there's just, just that one little adjustment. Any questions for Dr. Cyber? <coughs> uh, if not, um, do I have a motion uh, to approve the change to policy TCED-009? Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Lockler. We have a motion and a second to approve the change to policy TCED-009. Is there any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Uh, the policy has been approved. Thank you, Dr. Tomberlin and Dr. Seiberg. Uh, thank you, Commission members, advisors, and staff for your preparation for today's discussions. I'd like to remind Commission members that our next standing meeting will be held here on Thursday, October 11th from 9 to noon. We have now completed our meeting, and unless there's additional business, I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Dr. Jones. We have a, a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thanks, everyone. We're adjourned. <laughs>